Welcome to the Vita Day Bible School. In our sessions of recording so far, we have looked at the book of Colossians. Actually, the first, I think it was 13 verses. Now, before we continue with the book of Colossians, there is something we need to talk about first. Now, in the first 13 verses, we saw how Paul was praying for the believers in Colossia, and he was praying for them that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And then he continued saying the reason why he's praying that specific particular prayer. And there were three effects. The one was that they can walk a life worthy of God. The second one is that they can be strengthened to all endurance and patience with joy. And the third one was that they can thank God the Father in everything, because that is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, a God who also enabled us to be part of the inheritance of the sons of the light. He brought us over from darkness, from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light. Um, the reason why Paul prays that they can know what God wants uh, in contrast with what we want and what I want. I am under His authority. I am under His rule. I am in His kingdom, not my own. He is the king, not I. So that was a very important start for the letter to the Colossians. But before we continue with the reading of Colossians, I want to just have uh, one or two or maybe three talks with you about some of the core characteristics of the message of God. And uh, today I want to look at um, a rather peculiar passage, and that will take us to the Gospel of John. So we're going to pause Colossians just for now, and just go back to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 6. Uh, peculiar in this way, um, that the, the reaction of Jesus in this chapter is, well, it's, at first glance, rather strange. So let's look at it, see what happened and what we can learn from this. But I just want to tell you beforehand, this is a very powerful message. And uh, it affected the immediate um, people around Jesus in this chapter, as we will see just now. But it affects us here, 2,000 years later, dramatically. And it has affected the lives of people throughout the ages up until now. And it will continue to affect the lives of people until the second coming of our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. So if you have a Bible with you, I would recommend that you read with me these um, passages. Now, it's a rather lengthy chapter. Uh, we are not going to read the entire chapter. I think I'm going to uh, pick out about six, maybe seven verses from this passage. But I want to ask you to um, just, you know, maybe after this video, or you can even pause it now and read the entire chapter very, you know, patiently. Uh, don't haste through it. Just read it slowly and take it in what you're reading. Very important. Um, don't read anything else. Don't read a commentary at this stage or anything else. Just read the text and familiarize yourself with the text. That's extremely important. Uh, I'm just going to give you some pointers about this chapter um, that is very important for your personal walk with Jesus. Now, the, the topic, we could give this talk a topic and we could say, why do you seek Jesus? Why do you want to be or why are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Now, that's a very important question. It might not sound very important, but you'll see just now how Jesus confronts the people with this exact same question. Maybe not phrased in those words, but that is about the gist of it. Now, just before we start reading, I just want to give you some background to this that you probably already know. The John chapter 6 is the chapter where Jesus multiplies the bread. So it's a miraculous sign. It's called, it's called a sign in, in the Gospel of John. We'll see now why. But that's one of the, uh, the interesting um, traits of the Gospel of John. Matthew, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke uh, call the miracles of Jesus that. They call it miracles 
uh, and they it's translated miracle from the Greek word dunamis, which means the powerful working of God. But John diverts from using that word to describe the miracles of Jesus. He uses the word, the Greek word sameon, which means a sign, something pointing to something. So the sign is very important. It points us in the, di- in the right direction. But what it is pointing to is far more important than the sign itself. All right, so just keep that in mind. We'll come back to that just now. So uh, Jesus multiplied the bread and the crowd went ballistic. Uh, they just thought this was the best thing since sliced bread, pun intended. And they, uh, they wanted to make Jesus king with force. You'll see it now. We'll read it. It's part of the text. And Jesus, this was the chapter in the Gospel of John where Jesus was at the epitome, at the top of his popularity. He was extremely popular. And the people just flocked to him in droves. And thousands of people came to listen to Jesus preach. And, and he was literally and figuratively the talk of the town. Um, you know, people were talking about this rabbi from uh, from Nazareth, as they knew him, Jesus of Nazareth, and he was, I mean, his sermons were just absolutely amazing. They, they ca- he, he, Jesus captivated his audience. Uh, maybe in modern times, you could say people just, you know, went to his seminars or his conferences, and uh, with buses, you know, I mean, it was just, it was just absolutely amazing. Um, uh, that, that uh, you know, uh, in their day, there were no buses, of course, but just to give you the picture in a more modern setting. So, so they talked about what he was preaching about and, and how he preached. In, he was so different in his preaching, you know, different from the Pharisees or the rabbis that they knew or the leaders of the synagogues that they went to every week. You know the synagogues, and then somebody will preach there, and and but Jesus preached in a in a different way, and 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 the people were all struck by that. But 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 that wasn't the only thing. Um, uh, I think probably the top thing people all people were talking about was the miracles that Jesus performed. This was the the crowd um, magnet. Uh, and you know, people would say, "I couldn't believe my eyes." He healed um, a man, you know, a, a, who had leprosy, and he healed a, a blind boy, and and he, you know, and they would just go on and on and telling about these real miracles that happened right in front of their eyes, and it it happened so um, in such a normal fashion. There was no hype. There was no building up to a crescendo there was no music playing in the background there was no um, stage uh, auditoriums jesus would just walk among the people and and miracles would just happen that was verifiable and that was that was genuine and you know that was just uh, that was just amazing it captivated the minds and the hearts of the people and they they flocked to to jesus so, but this chapter, unfortunately, also is not only the chapter where Jesus was at his most popular, but it, it also marked the start of Jesus' rising unpopularity. And we can also see this in this chapter, in John chapter 6. So the chapter starts with people wanting to make him king by force, and the chapter ends on a rather somber note, where the people decided that they cannot they can no longer follow jesus and that jesus even turned to his own disciples asking them don't you also want to leave me now wow that is you know that's quite a contrast in one chapter uh, but it marks a very important happening in the gospel of john now the the question we should ask here is how did jesus come from being so popular to being you know, rather unpopular, and lots of people just desert him. In the same chapter, what happened? Now, I'm just going to give you a heads up before we look at the verses, and that was that Jesus instigated this conflict, and he instigated the conflict on purpose. This is also important for you to notice. And that the core, the crux of the conflict, was about the identity 
of Jesus. Now we get to the question that we started with. Why do you seek or are seeking, why do you follow or want to follow Jesus? And this is the question Jesus posed to them. And he told them, Jesus told them, that the reason they want to follow him is a reason he is not interested in. And that's where the conflict really picked up. So, follow with me through the text. And we're going to read our first part. We're going to read. We're going to skip the multiplication of the bread and the, the sign itself. You can uh, read it at leisure. Maybe after this video, we're going to start in verse 14. So, our first passage is John 6, verse 14 to 15. And uh, in the English Standard Bible version, it reads like this. When the people saw the sign that he had done, John using the word Simeon, a sign that was pointing to something. We'll get to that now. When they saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Now the Jews, of course, expecting the Messiah of God and their, uh, their idea of the Messiah predominantly was that God would send someone that would free them from the Roman occupation. Now we, and we know this from other parts in the New Testament, other passages, and how Jesus reacted towards that. But they expected a Messiah. They respected or expected a Redeemer, a Savior that would save them from, well, their current troubles and tribulations. Now verse 15 says, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself, by force. There, there, is only, there is only one position in Israel to be king. Now that position is already filled and it's a political position. It has to do with authority and rule and politics and power and might and influence. They want to put Jesus by force in that position. Now how, you know, we, we knew by this time they were... There were several organizations working within the nation of Israel, rebel organizations who wanted to, with by force, overthrow the Russian occupation. And it continued long after uh, Jesus' crucifixion. So they, they want to place Jesus at the heart of this, this cauldron, this burning, um, let's call it something, explosive situation. This is how popular he is at this moment. And, and who would not? I mean, who would not want to put Jesus in the position of king? I mean, it would mean, just, you know, to name one thing, it would mean that they would have food security for the entire period of his reign and his rule. I mean, this man can take five pieces of bread, five little bread rolls, if you want, um, and, and, and feed an entire crowd of thousands of people. This is amazing. Just think, you know, what, what it would mean to the nation of Israel if this man could be king. So Jesus withdrew from this. And he withdrew to a place where he could be alone and by himself. Now, whenever Jesus was alone and by himself, he was in conversation with his father, and um, I can just imagine what the conversation was about after this situation. So then we proceed in the text uh, and we jump to verse 26. So if you're following with me in your Bible, let's read where it says, Jesus answered them. Now, just sorry, before I read this, this is now the, the next day uh, where they where they were looking for, he disappeared, he withdrew and disappeared, went to a place all by himself. And they were looking for him, searching for him, and, and they reached him the next day. They found him. And they said, you know, what, you know what's the story? <laughs> you know, why the strange behavior? Why do you withdraw? And, and they were still actively pursuing Jesus. Now, that's a good thing, is it not? I mean, is it? That's a good thing, that they want him to be king. Is it not? Isn't that what, we, what we're preaching when we preach the Lordship of Christ? They want Him to be King. Jesus said, no, that was a bad thing. 
Now let's see why. So, so here starts the conflict. Verse 26 marks the beginning of the conflict between the crowds and Jesus. So let's see what he says. So back to 26, uh, John 6, 26. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. That's a, that's a cryptic, uh, well, for us now, 2,000 years later, this is, this is somewhat a cryptic um, part of the speech that Jesus gave them. We need to unpack it a little bit, and it wouldn't take much time. So let, let's see uh, how well I can do this so that you can understand what Jesus is saying here. Let's go back to John's use of the word Simeon, the Greek word Simeon that is translated as a sign. Now, as I previously said, the, the word Simeon means a sign that is pointing towards something else. So let's say, let's just say it's a, I live in a town called Hermanus. So let's say you want to visit me and you're on your way to Hermanus, there would be a sign that says Hermanus 30 kilometers that way. That's a very important sign. It keeps you on the road. It points you to where your destination is and how far it is from you. It's very important for a driver to have that kind of information if you don't have a GPS nowadays. But, but you don't go to the sign and camp around the sign. The sign is important as a sign. But what it is pointing to is far more important than the sign, and that is the destination. Now, John realized and understood that the miracles that Jesus performed were signs that pointed to something far greater than the sign he performed itself. And it pointed to who Jesus is. The sign was a revelation, was a point of information about the person and identity of Jesus Christ. Now, at the end of John's Gospel, he wrote a, a little paragraph explaining why did he write this Gospel. You can read it for yourself in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, where he says, and now you have to... Um, pardon me for translating directly from the Afrikaans because that's the language I usually minister in and it's the Bible that I use. It's my home, my home tongue, my mother tongue. So he said, um, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not recorded in this gospel, this gospel of John, but I recorded these and he only chose seven signs, seven miracles. Of all the miracles that Jesus performed, John chose, carefully chose seven and portrayed them as signs that revealed the character and person of Jesus Christ, who he really is. And then he says, I wrote these signs so that you can believe that he is the Christ and by believing you might have life in his name. That's the direct translation from the Afrikaans Bible. You would get the proper wording in your English Bible. Um, this, is, this is an important thing. The, the reason for the Gospel of John is given in that paragraph. The reason for writing the Gospel of John is that you can believe that Jesus is who he said he is. And by believing that, that's very particular, and also... Uh, very exclusive by believing that you might have life in his name. So we would say that Jesus came to give us life. That was one of John's, uh, uh, the scripture in John, John chapter 10, verse 10, a very well-known scripture that is often quoted and often quoted outside of context and um, stripped of his real meaning, but that for another conversation. Uh, Jesus came to give us life and life in abundance, but that is life according to God's definition, and it's, it's very restricted in its meaning, and uh, it's very exclusive, it's not available to everybody. The life of God is not available to everybody. Well, we could say it's available to everybody, but it's not applicable to everybody. We could say it that way, maybe that's a better way of saying it. It's only attainable, it's available, but not attainable, unless you believe that Jesus is 
who he said he is and by believing that also uh, you know lay your life before him give your life to him give your life to him because he is who he said he is your faith is worth nothing if you don't give or submit your life to him now that is incidentally also the point jesus is going to drive at uh, this is the major thing he wants to say so in this verse 26 john 6 verse 26 jesus says you don't want to make me king because you saw the signs now we could say but they saw the sign they saw the multiplication of the bread yes they did they witnessed it they ate of the bread and and it it just blew their minds but they they didn't realize what it was about the only thing they saw was that this man can give them what they want and what they need they did not realize that this man is god they do not want to make him king for who he is and that is the crux of verse 26 they want to make him king for what they can get from him let's read it again truly truly i say to you you are seeking me not because you saw signs but because you ate your fill of the loaves now we could uh, let's ask the question again that we started with why do you want to follow jesus or why are you following jesus is it because of what you can get from him or because of who he is and the difference is vast now i can tell you in my life i won't tell you the story now maybe we can do it at, a, at another time but there was a time in my life where that was exactly the reason i wanted to follow jesus I wanted to follow Jesus for what I can get from him, what he can give me, not for who he is. In fact, uh, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't informed about who he is. I mean, even, even if I was, you know, I knew he was, you know, they say he's the son of God. He came to earth. He died for me. He rose again um, to give me life. He reconciled me with the father. I mean, that I knew. I grew up in a Christian home, but, but, I, I I knew that, but I didn't know that. Uh, and the only reason, the driving force within me, wanting to make Jesus king, was what the preachers who preached the word to me at that time only focused on what I can get from Jesus, what He can do for me, and what He did for me, and 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 uh, how I am after what Jesus did, how I am the absolute focus of God. And how I am, you know, I'm just fantastic and amazing. And all because of what Christ did, of course. But, uh, you know, the focus was on me and, and my interests and my needs and my ambitions and my identity. And it was me, me, me. The, the reason Jesus was in the picture was just to enable all those glorious things on me. And, and, uh, and I wanted to follow that kind of Jesus. And I, I, said, I, I signed up for that. I signed up for this Jesus who can multiply bread when I need it. Who can give me what I want when I want it. I signed up to follow that Jesus. And of course, uh, it, it didn't end well. It ended in, uh, well, lots of trauma and heartbreak and disillusionment and I decided to to not want want anything to do with Jesus or Christianity or the church because he didn't do what he was supposed to do when I needed it and there was this major crisis and falling away from the faith now unfortunately my testimony has that as one of the major chapters in my life I came back to Jesus, which is a wonderful, wonderful testimony and brilliant story to tell. But that was the crisis of these people, exactly the crisis. And Jesus actually accuses them that they want to follow him for the wrong reasons. Now, listen, listen, I want to tell you this. Don't fool yourself by thinking it doesn't matter what for what reasons you are following Christ as long as you follow Christ. No, 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 there's no such thing. No, 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 no. That is a 
That is a wrong way of thinking. No, because I can follow Christ, where I make Him king as long as He do, as He does what I want Him to do. I make Him king as long as He does what I want Him to do, which means I am the king, not He. He is a puppet king. I am the real king. So He's there for me. Well, that's not the gospel at all. Not one single bit is that the gospel. The gospel is where, is where I, I submit my entire life, my wants, my needs, my will, my rights, my privileges, my identity, my entire existence. I submit to Him unconditionally. There are no conditions attached. I submit to His Lordship. Because there is only one king here, and it's not I, it's him. So, that's where the conflict starts. Jesus says, you ate the bread, the sign, it was a sign, and it pointed to me. Yet, you don't come to me for who I am. You come to me for what I can give you. So, let's read further on, and we see now from verse 26 to, I'm going to start reading from verse 53, the conflict and the tension absolutely escalated between Jesus and the crowd. So read it for yourself, um, maybe after this video. So verse 30, 53 to verse 57, John chapter 6 reads, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. Now, here is, a, <laughs> here is an interesting thing. Jesus puts it to them that they need to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And Jesus didn't bother to explain it. Now, there was a reason for. They were, they were not at all interested to follow Jesus for who he is. So he, he gives them an analogy, but he puts it to them in such a way that it will offend them. You will see it now, that Jesus will actually point to this fact. It will offend them. And this offense will also unmask them. This offense will prove that they are not seeking Jesus for who He is. They are seeking Jesus for what they can get from Him. And that's the only interest that they have. And that Jesus is not interested in followers who want to follow Him in that way. And that He, he gives them this, this strange thing. He tells them, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, if they were truly interested uh, in the person and identity of Jesus, wanting to follow him for who he is, and they were presented with this impossible situation of Jesus' words, they would have asked him, said, we are perplexed by this. I mean, we are even, we are even appalled by the idea of eating your flesh and drinking your blood. I mean, how macabre this is. But please explain to us what you mean. Now, what is interesting is that nobody asked Jesus to explain anything. Now, there were several situations in the past where Jesus would, would tell a parable, and it would be very cryptic. And then the disciples will come to him afterwards and say, Lord, please tell us what it meant. We, we heard what you said, but we don't understand a word of it. Tell us. They were, interested. they were interested in Christ. 
for who he is, his identity, realizing that there is something in this man, something big, something of God, coming from God, recognizing and realizing that he is from God. And he said something that they absolutely don't understand. And instead of just saying, oh, well, you know, that was, that was quite, uh, you know, embarrassing and that was impossible to understand. And, you know, so, you know, let's just go elsewhere. Uh, to somebody who preaches in a more simple way, they pursue Jesus. But it doesn't happen in chapter 6. In chapter 6, nobody comes to Jesus. We'll see the role the disciples played in this chapter just now. But they, they don't ask him about this enigma, this cryptic situation, the words that he was saying. So in John 60, and uh, 6 verse 60, pardon, just after Jesus said this, and he repeated this eating of the flesh and drinking of the blood repeatedly, you know, I mean, uh, uh, over and over, repeated it over and over. And, and in, in uh, verse 60, he says, oh, uh, John writes, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? And what suddenly happens is Jesus uh, was sifting through the people through those who want to follow him because of what they can get from him and those who want to follow him for who they realize he is. And Jesus is sifting the crowd, separating those two groups from one another by the things that he's saying. And his disciples, now the large crowd, Jesus had, the, the disciples of Jesus was actually divided also into two groups. You had the 12, the specific disciples that he called to follow him. But he had, he had hundreds of disciples, people who followed him, who followed his teachings and, and you know, who, who actively sought him out and who started to identify with him as a preacher and a, and a miracle working man of God. And this group, is recorded as saying in John 6, verse 60, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? Verse, verse 61, but Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said, do you take offense at this? Now, here is the thing. If I follow Jesus for what I can get from him, I will easily take offense in Jesus easily uh, because I have conditions for his rule in my life as I said you know he actually becomes the puppet king in my life not the king and there are conditions to uh, why I would allow him to work in my life he has to he has to deliver on those conditions. And if he doesn't, then I get offended. And then I say, I don't want to serve a God like this. I'm not serving him because he's God. I'm serving him for the benefits that I can get from him. And Jesus will offend me. Now the true disciples of Christ who worship him for who he is, for who he said he is, because he is God, when they get to a place of possible offense, they embrace the offense and submit to Christ regardless of the possible offense. And that marks the true worshipers, the true disciples, the true followers of Christ. You know, you know, as opposed to the other reasons why you would want to follow Jesus. Again, the question, why are you following Jesus? Why do you want to follow him? And they took offense. Let's just read their reaction. Verse 66. After this, now, you will, re you will see, when you read this chapter slowly by yourself, you will see, 
that Jesus didn't bother to explain the eating of the flesh and the drinking of the blood. Not even after they told him that these words are too hard. Who can listen to it? And they took offense in Jesus. He didn't. He didn't appease the crowd. He didn't tell them and said, okay, listen, listen, guys, listen. I see you don't understand exactly what I was trying to say here. And, you know, clarified the matter. In no way did he do that. He was waiting for them to say, please, Lord, explain to us. What are you saying? But they were not interested in that. Jesus now suddenly didn't fit the bill anymore. He didn't fit their plans for him anymore. And they were not interested in him anymore. So, they no longer walked with him. They went away. Then, there was one thing left to do. After this conflict and dramatic situation, Jesus turned to his own disciples, the twelve, that he chose by name. And he had to confront them with the same choice that all these people made. He had to confront them, which he did. Verse 67. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? You're welcome. That's a very important thing. You will be presented with that choice often in your life. As a follower of Jesus, you will be presented with that choice. You will be presented with that choice also by Christ himself. Do you want to go away? Why are you seeking me? Why do you want to follow me? Because I am who I said I am and you worship me for that? I remember without knowing about this chapter, without knowing the content of this chapter, the message of this chapter, way back, it was 19... 90, many years ago, after I signed up to follow Jesus for what I can get from him, and, and then a crisis happened and my whole world disintegrated and, and God did nothing. He didn't produce on all his promises and how he will make me, you know, great and fantastic and wonderful. As, as people told me, you know, I mean, follow this guy. You will always have bread. You know, you will do whatever you need to do. It's like a, it's like a genie, uh, Aladdin's genie in a bottle. You just rub this lamp, you know, rub the lamp and the genie will appear and give you wishes and whatever you wish, your wish is his command, uh, which is the gospel that many people hear. So I was there and then nothing of the sort happened to me. And I accused Jesus of being unfaithful and untrue to his word. That was now his word according to my definitions. And I forsake him. And I went away from him. And I remember the night uh, two years later, I remember the night I came back to him. Now, without knowing this, I didn't know this, uh, the content of chapter 6, John. The Holy Spirit didn't leave me. He kept on convicting me of sin, righteousness and judgment, as Jesus explained in John 16. And, and, and I was very militant and aggressive towards Christians. So, according to people's opinion of me, I was past the point of redemption, I suppose. But according to what God saw, it was a different picture. There were things happening in my heart. I never revealed those. I never told people about it. I never, you know, I never dropped my guard. But there were things happening in my heart. And when the night I came back to Jesus, I, you know, I prayed a prayer 
that was just one sentence. And without knowing, it summed up the entire chapter 6 of the Gospel of John. The prayer I prayed was, Lord, I will worship you as God, even though you never ever again answer any of my prayers. Now, that's the point we need to get to. Are you prepared to worship him as God with absolute authority, even though he never answers any of your prayers? Don't wiggle yourself out of that corner. That question places you in a tight spot. Don't wiggle out of it. Answer it. Are you prepared? Because that is what following Jesus is all about. Yes. He powerfully works within my life. Yes, he answered many of the prayers. And yes, I have a close relationship with Jesus and I learn how to follow him and I learn how to obey him and I learn how to know him, have a relationship with me, him according to him, not according to me, but according to him. Yes, all that happens. But I, I need to get past this question. I need to answer this question truthfully in my heart. Am I prepared to follow him? even though he never answers any of my prayers or does anything for me. I can put it in different words. Are you prepared to follow Jesus because he is God? Or are you only interested in him because of what you might possibly get from him? And maybe you have preachers in your life, people who preach the word, who fans this selfish ambition in your heart that Jesus is there for you they don't tell you that you are there for him yes he is also there for you but first you are for him you lay your life down before him you crown him the absolute king of your life you you there's, I'm looking for the, the the best English word here and I can't find it but maybe you already have it there. See me struggling to get this word. You, you, you sign off. You, you sell yourself to him. To be his property entirely. That's where it starts. That's where the gospel starts. And Jesus even told the people that they must count the cost before they decide to follow him. There is a huge, huge cost involved. And in the, the society where we are in here, nobody talks about the cost. We never talk about the cost of discipleship. We never talk about the fact that Jesus is a stone of offense. Nobody even, well, there are many people who doesn't even know that. And if they do, they've heard about it before. Maybe they stumbled across the verses that describes Jesus as a stone of offense. And you ask them to explain the offense of Jesus. They can't. They can't explain the cost of the discipleship. They can't explain the offense factor of Christ. Because the Christ that they are being presented with is a very agreeable fellow the genie in the lamp of Aladdin. There's no offense in him. He loves everybody. He accepts everything. It's all inclusive. And he's just there to divinely uh, make your dreams and ambitions happen. That's not who Jesus is. And that's not what discipleship or following Christ entails. So, Jesus turns to his 12 disciples and asks them, Do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom, to whom shall we go? Not where shall we go. To whom? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed 
and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Even though there are situations where we are presented with taking offense in you, even though there are things that happen in our lives that we cannot understand, even though we ask you for something and you do not provide, you do not give, you do not explain, we know who you are. And it's because we know who you are that we worship you, even though there are many things we do not understand. Our faith, our trust in you is that you will, at some stage, whether that be in this life or the one hereafter, but you will explain everything to us, you will reveal everything to us, and we will understand and see clearly. But even if I cannot understand clearly now and see clearly now, I know who you are, and that's why I follow you. This is so critical for anybody who professes to follow Christ, or have an, uh, has an interest in following Christ, why do you want to follow Him? You need to answer this question with a clear conscience in your heart before God. Do you want to follow Him for who He is or for what you can get from Him? Can you pray and say, I will worship you as God even though you do not answer my prayers? Let me just put a footnote to this before I finish. Too many times, much too often, I hear people encouraging, I hear preachers encouraging people to follow Christ because He will make them successful. He will make them rich. He will provide in their every need. And I'm thinking, they are deceiving the crowds. They are actively doing what Christ is actively working against. They are encouraging people to do what Christ is not interested in. He's not interested in anybody following Him for what they can get. Unless they follow Him for who He is. He's not interested in their, in their following, in their being His disciples. He does not run after the disciples when they leave Him. When they say, you know, they don't follow Him anymore. They say these words. They, he doesn't run after them and say, no, 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 wait, guys, wait, guys, wait, 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 wait. You're making a big mistake here. He leaves them. He lets them be. This is an amazing thing to notice. So it brings us to a personal conflict in our lives. And we need to work this conflict through, not ignore it, not try to explain it away. We need to work it through. We need to answer this conflict. We need to, we need to see what is going on in our hearts. We often think we know. We don't. God knows. I need to ask God to reveal my heart. I need to come to grips with this thing get to a point where I can answer this question in the correct way and say, Lord, I will worship you even if it kills me. I will worship you even if you don't do what I want you to do. I will worship you even if there are situations and circumstances that I don't understand. But I know you are in control. And you will reveal yourself and the truth to me when it is the right time, when I need to see, when I need to know, but even if I don't see and don't know, I bow before you. We need to get there and answer the question.